All right, hi guys. Uh, I'm going to be talking about oceans for the next few days, and uh, this is going to be a little bit complicated because we have to break up oceans into different topics. And so what I'm going to focus on today is just oceans, ocean currents, uh, and we're going to specifically focus on what's called a thermohaline current and just a wind current. So we're going to just focus on one topic today, and we'll get into some more details over the next a uh, couple days. So anyway, I'm going to show you guys my presentation. This presentation is online, um, but it has everything uh, to it. So I'm going to be jumping around as you'll see as we go through this. So we'll just start with um, just the idea of, you know, how vast the oceans are. They cover almost 75% of the Earth's surface. And so it's a topic that you can go into um, in depth in a class called oceanography which if you wanted to take that, that would be like a college level course. And you, it's a really, really interesting topic. I took some classes on oceanography in college and it's it's some pretty cool stuff. Uh, and there's all different parts of it that you can get into, uh, both marine biology, but just in general oceanography. So uh, just kind of the basic stuff, um, just to let you know that the oceans, obviously, you know, they're salt water and they're quite salty. Uh, if you've ever opened your mouth in the ocean before, 3.5% salt, and that salt can be broken down into different types. Most of it is sodium chloride, which is essentially just table salt. It's the same stuff that you have probably in your kitchen. Um, and you, as you can see in this diagram here, uh, sodium and chlorine make up the majority of the sea salt uh, that you'll find in the ocean. Um, now, oceans are salty because of a couple of things. And I, I just want you to, to realize this. Uh, obviously, you have water, and that water is uh, is running off the land into the ocean. But also along the way, as that water runs off the land, it carries with it a whole bunch of dissolved stuff. And all that dissolved stuff is salt, it, that it is from the processes of weathering and erosion. And so all this salt runs off the land and then runs into the ocean. Now, as the oceans evaporate, the water goes up into the atmosphere, but the salt stays behind. So any salt running off of the land stays in the ocean. The water is the only thing really circulating up into the atmosphere. And then you'll see a video of this uh, from Bill Nye. This popcorn is good, but it needs a little salt. Yeah. Now, if this were a bowl of seawater instead of a bowl of popcorn, it would have this much salt. Mm. Mm. Oh, man, that's salty. But in the ocean, there are quadrillions of tons of salt. There's other minerals, too, and lots of living things. I mean, the ocean is so vast. There's so much to explore. There's so much water. Wind and salt keep ocean water moving in huge currents, rivers of water flowing through water. This is our indoor ocean of science. This is our small salty sea. Heat from the sun makes water in the ocean evaporate. Here we're using this burner. The water evaporates, but the salt stays in the ocean. The water goes up into the sky, cools and forms clouds. Then it falls down as rain. So this water is like rainwater. It's good. Yeah. Oh, it is good. It's not salty at all. So wind and rain make different parts of the ocean have different amounts of salt. There are different saltiness. So over here, we have some very salty water. And here we have some water that's not so salty. Watch what happens when I raise this gate. They're going to mix. Watch. The gate's open and they're up. See? Very salty water is heavier, and it pushes some of the not so salty water out of the way, and we get a current. Now, winds also make ocean currents. Ocean currents move huge amounts of ocean water all over the world, all the time. Ocean currents are cool. Uh, that I'm going to show you in a little bit. So uh, it's really chemical weathering that brings the salt into the ocean. It's by runoff. And that runoff brings a whole lot of salt. I mean, it's 4 billion tons of salt every year from all the land surfaces that goes into the oceans. 
Some of the salt comes in underneath through these vents uh, in the bottom of the ocean, but most of the time it's just runoff. And so you'll have a whole bunch of salt coming in by runoff and then water will evaporate and go out uh, into the atmosphere. Okay, so the salt comes from runoff and, uh, and also a little bit from deep sea vents, but just realize uh, that there's a whole bunch being put in at, at a time. This is just a diagram showing you um, the average uh, ocean depth as well as the average land depth. Most of the ocean is unexplored territory. It's really deep stuff. Uh, it's vast, it's huge. Uh, and most of the ocean is at a depth of 3,800 meters, which is not a very easily explored territory. The deepest part of the oceans are in the trenches, and you guys know the Marianas Trench is the deepest part in the Pacific. Okay. This is showing you a diagram of the North Atlantic Ocean. And as you can tell, it's very complicated. You have this big, huge, long mountain range, which you guys know is called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It runs down the middle. There is various volcanic activity going on in different areas. So you'll see some little, little mountains here and there. There's this thing called the Continental Shelf right here, which is right next to the continents. And uh, if you go out, let's say, 100 miles off the coast of, uh, let's say, Boston up here, uh, it'll be relatively shallow water, and then it will drop suddenly on this shelf right here. Okay. And so there's different parts of the ocean that are explored, mostly along the coastlines. When you get out into this deeper part of the ocean out here, it's called the Abyssal Plain. That's pretty deep stuff, not as easily explored. Uh, and uh, that makes up the majority of the ocean. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you guys this video on ocean currents, uh, and which we'll play right now. This is Making Waves from NOAA's National Ocean Service. In today's episode, what are ocean currents? Now, the ocean never stands still. Even here in this quiet marina, you can see the water is slowly moving. If you stood at this spot for many hours, you'd witness the rise and fall of the tide, caused by the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun on our planet. But what's causing the motion you see here with this gently swaying anemone on the seafloor off the Atlantic coast? This is ocean current. The reason we have currents in the ocean is a bit more complicated. Let's go back to the shoreline to witness one cause of ocean currents, the tides. Tidal currents are strongest near the shore, in bays, and in estuaries along our coasts. This illustration will give you an idea of how it works. As the tide rises, water moves inland. This is called a flood current. As the tide recedes, the water moves seaward. This is called an ebb current. You can see the movement of water here by watching the green seaweed move back and forth. Now let's zoom out and look at what's happening near the surface of the ocean on a global scale over time. At this scale, currents are driven primarily by two different forces. The first force is something we all know, the wind. This animation is from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. It shows surface ocean currents around the world during the period from June 2005 to December 2007. Check our show notes for a link to the full animation. Now let's take a few moments to look at a few prominent surface ocean currents. Do you see that? You've probably heard of this current. It's called the Gulf Stream. It transports nearly 4 billion cubic feet of water per second. Now let's speed up a bit and go look at another special current. Coming into view now is the Kuroshio Current. It's located off the east coast of Japan. This is the ocean's largest current. It can travel between 25 to 75 miles a day and is equal in volume to 6,000 large rivers. Surface ocean currents on the open ocean are fantastically complicated and beautiful. They're driven by a complex global wind system. But there's one more ocean current force that you may have never heard of. It's called thermohaline circulation. Thermo means heat, and haline refers to salinity. This term describes how changes in heat and salt content constantly change the density of ocean water. Cold, salty water is dense and sinks to the bottom of the ocean, and eventually this water returns to the surface through mixing and wind-driven upwelling. On a global scale, the sinking and rising of ocean water creates what scientists call the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. This belt affects the Earth's climate by driving warm water from the equator and cold water from the poles around the Earth. 
It takes water almost a thousand years to move through the whole conveyor belt. So there you have it. Tides, wind, and heat and salinity are all factors that put the motion in the ocean. This is Making Waves from NOAA's National Ocean Service. As you can tell from the video, there's different types of ocean circulation. And one thing that they did talk about was called a thermohaline circulation. So that's what I want to talk about here. Oceans can circulate vertically, meaning up and down from the surface down to the deepest parts of the ocean, which you saw earlier. And that's all due to differences in density. Now you can have differences in density based upon how much salt content there is. The saltier the water, the more dense the water. And so water will sink when it's salty. Water will also sink when it's cold. And so when you have cold, salty water, the water sinks to the bottom of the ocean. When the water is more fresh water, less salty, and when the water is warmer, it will rise. And so you can have a circulation up and down vertically when you have differences both in the salt content as well as the difference in the temperature. Okay, so that's called thermohaline circulation. Thermo meaning heat and haline meaning salt content. Now, as you can see in this big, huge conveyor belt, and they showed this in the video, this is the great global ocean conveyor belt circulation. So as you can see, the red here is really showing you the surface. All this warm water is going to be located closer to the equator. And that water will run away from the equator. And as it gets closer to the poles, and you can see this up here in the North Atlantic, which I'm pointing out here, the water gets colder up here in the north and it will sink and it will run along the bottom of the ocean in this blue line here. And then it will start to warm up again as it gets close to the equator here in the Indian Ocean and it will rise back up to the surface here. And then it will run around, okay? So you have all this movement of water across the globe just due to differences both in temperature and differences in salt content. So the saltiest, coldest parts of the ocean are up in the poles up here, and the warmest, most freshwater locations are right here uh, along the middle in these red lines. Okay, so that's the global conveyor belt of thermohaline circulation. Now, the other way that the oceans will circulate is just due to the air blowing across the surface, and that's wind circulation. This is the surface ocean currents, which is located in your reference table. And I believe that the page that we're referring to here, let me just check, is page four, okay, in your reference table. And so if you look at your reference table on page four, you'll see all these ocean currents across the globe. They're all labeled. And uh, if you notice uh, all the labels, some of the arrows are kind of just a black arrow and some of them are a white arrow. And those different arrows are referring to what type of currents they are. And so if you look at the white arrows, they're called cool currents. Okay, for example, the California current is a cool current. And the black arrows, like this one over here, off the eastern coast of the US, that is a warm current. Okay, so warm currents are black arrows, white arrows are cool currents. And if you want, and I'll show you a picture of this in a second, um, I highlighted all the warm currents one color and all the cool currents a different color, just to kind of make them pop out a little bit more. And what I'm referring to is highlighting the word. So I'll show you a picture of how I did that right now. Now, the other thing to, to take note of is how these currents, where they're warm, they're really close or they're starting near the equator. So I'll give you an example. The Gulf Stream current right here starts down in this area close to the equator near the Caribbean. And that's why it's a warm current because it's starting where it's warm and it moves up towards the north. Okay, a cool current has its origins or it starts in the 
polar region. So the California current starts up here and moves south towards the equator. Okay, same is true with the Peru current. Look at this. It starts down here close to Antarctica and moves up towards the equator. Okay. Here's another one over here, the Brazil current on the eastern coast of South America. It starts near the equator, but it moves south to the South Pole. Okay, so just note that cool currents have their origins in cool regions, and warm currents have their origins in warmer regions near the equator. Okay, so that's the big thing to take away from uh, ocean currents on page four. Okay, and the other thing that we're going to look at tomorrow is this big circulation. This huge circulation, look at the Atlantic Ocean. The North Atlantic Ocean's got this big circle. Okay, and if you, if you start here, let's say in Florida, the Gulf Stream Current, it goes up north up the coast, and then you can go all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, this North Atlantic Current right here, and then you come south on the Canary Current, and then you come across the Atlantic Ocean in what's called the North Equatorial Current. And this is called a, a, an ocean gyre. And these big circulation circulating gyres are found all over the globe. Here's one in the North Atlantic. Okay, It goes all the way around in this big circulation. And you see one in the Indian Ocean down here. And you see one in the South Pacific Ocean down here. And you also see one in the South Atlantic Ocean over here. And these gyres, you can get in a raft. If you had no sail, the ocean currents will just take you across in, in a big circle like this. And back in the day, like Columbus, they actually used these gyres to their advantage to get across the ocean. Okay, And you can see this picture here shows you these large curving patterns of circulation called gyres in the Atlantic and in the Pacific. And uh, they're, they're important. Uh, they... they um, are something that uh, we can take advantage of when sailing, uh, but also they're important because this is how uh, stuff will circulate in the oceans, including stuff that, you know, is like trash. Okay. Now this is called the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is uh, something located out in the Pacific Ocean. It's huge. It's approximately the size of like three Spain and Portugal's combined. So it's this massive thing. And what it is, it's a bunch of trash from runoff uh, for off of the coast of America, as well as off the coast of China and Japan, as well as shipping containers. When they spill anything, they kind of get stuck in this garbage patch. And it basically just moves around the Pacific Ocean in this big gyre. And really, it's just plastic that's floating just below the surface. And uh, it's... It's tiny little stuff. Uh, some of it is floating bottles and things, but most of it is tiny broken up plastic pieces. And I'll give you a link to a video about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in case you're interested about that.